Americans are, I'm sure, used to being criticized by people from other countries. It comes with being the richest, freest, most powerful nation in the history of the world. Everyone else has penis envy. And by and large, Americans have dismissed these same criticisms for the same sensible reasons, slapping their big nuclear-tipped trident missiles on the table and letting their girth do the talking. Europeans, who maintain or pretend at least at a sense of cultural superiority, and who look down their noses at the supposedly uncivilized antics of the Yanks, shorn as they are of manners and etiquette, do so from within cities and sometimes entire countries whose last significant cultural achievements were made centuries ago. They, I suppose I must say we, point to the crumbling relics of what once passed for our civilizations and say, look, Yanks, you might have all the money but you don't have this, carefully forgetting to mention that none of us built any of this, and we lack the skill even to keep what we have from falling down. Americans, meanwhile, pay us no heed whatsoever as they head off to watch the Super Bowl in one of their thousands of modern coliseums. But there is one thing I think we can teach, and Americans could learn from, and that's how to manage endings, when to let things go. It's become something of a cliché, but cliché-like stereotype tends to convey something accurate. When it comes to film and TV, America does not know how or when to stop. When, in Europe or the United Kingdom, we produce movies and TV series that are truly brilliant, that stand as artistic achievements, that have stories to tell and things to say, and that tell those stories and say those things exceptionally well, we rightly laud them, and then, when it's time for them to end, we let them end. There's an especial poignance in saying goodbye to something that's given you so much, but nothing lasts forever, and nothing should. Knowing when to bow out is as much a part of storytelling as knowing how to begin. A book, a band, a sports star, a film or TV series that does wonders at the opening must know how to close. The ending of a narrative is as important, if not more important, than its beginning. There are a number of great series produced on my side of the Atlantic. Picking some at random, I could give you Armando Iannucci's sublime political satire The Thick of It and its even smarter ancestor, Yes Minister. I could give you the original British version of House of Cards. I could give you The Detectorists or the 70s adaptation of Lucare's Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, Peaky Blinders, Inspector Morse, The Office. While everyone thinks of J.K. Rowling's merits as a prose stylist, Harry Potter is objectively renowned and much loved, and it is finished. Good as these things were and are, they are all complete. Their completeness is bittersweet. You can want more of any number of them, wish that the story had continued, whilst at the same time acknowledging that dragging them on would have seen them deplete and diminish, giving us a final product that would have been less precisely because it was more. It's a truism summed up by Robert Frost, who wrote that nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold. Her early leaves are flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief, so dawn goes down to day. Nothing gold can stay. Frost was himself American, but it's a lesson Americans, by and large, have not learned, or at least Hollywood hasn't. Gold might deplete, but my god, you'll eke out every last little bit of it you can get before you let go of the source. How and why is Rocky still alive? Why do you insist on roiding up Arnie for another run, well, not a run, another creaky hip limp maybe at the Terminator? Why did Hollywood decide that the Alien franchise was a good place to explore the meaning and origins of life? Why is Star Wars violated harder than the only crack whore in San Francisco? Why didn't you close the office after season three or four? Nobody needs nine. And how were the friends still friends after ten? Rambo should be out on the streets like so many of your unfortunate veterans. The staff at Parks and Recreation should have been permanently furloughed by at least season six. No one needed a seventh. The Simpsons stopped being funny around the time I was born. Jean-Luc Picard should have been pensioned off. Neo is dead, he's not Jesus, he doesn't need a second coming. There is such a thing as too many Batmans. Lara Croft needs to get herself knocked up and settle down. Why wait 20 years for another Avatar when you could wait forever? How long until some tired hack realises that great white sharks can have up to 12 mini white sharks and decides to bring Jaws back, or tries a Jaws origin story, or decides an all-female Jaws reboot is a terribly clever idea? And so on, and so on. Nostalgia is a poignant and beautiful thing. Relics are a reminder of past greatness. The sense of loss when you look at the Parthenon is part of the point of the Parthenon. But you can't be nostalgic if you don't let things die. You can't appreciate the whole if you won't stop adding to it. And you can't, and you shouldn't, try and recreate past glories by bringing nostalgia back to the present. The word in its constituent parts is comprised of nostos, homecoming, and algia, pain. Loss is its point. Loss is what makes the thing special. Dragging it out, or trying to revive it, 
misses that point and cheapens the very thing you're trying to venerate. Which leads us inevitably to the MCU. Does it have anything left to offer us, or has it told its story? Is this another example of Hollywood's inability to let things retire, to bow out gracefully, or to die? Does it have anything left to say? Current offerings would suggest the answer is no. And its most recent, Hawkeye, now streaming on Disney+, Plus, only strengthens this conviction. If one word or one feeling must sum it up, that word, that feeling, would be fatigue. It's artistically empty. Narratively, it's not so much bad as it is redundant. In attempting one of those renewals or recastings familiar perhaps to fans of comics, but somewhat less so to everybody else, it just shows how little there is left in the MCU of what once animated it. It does nothing new. The MCU hasn't done anything new in years, with the possible exception of WandaVision, and even then that exhausted its creative powers halfway through what was a very short series. But Hawkeye is just tired. The MCU seems tired. And like the aging sports star who has nothing left to trade on save past glories, watching it stumble on, missing the beats it used to hit, trying the moves it lacks the youth and vigour to pull off anymore, watching the body strain in a futile attempt to move as it used to, it's just sad. Hawkeye is exhausted before it's even midway through its first episode. It begins with a flashback to 2012 and the attack on New York in The Avengers, again replaying past glories, and this is so often a classic example of the doomed revival. But after that, it lacks the imagination even to place itself in context. One Division and The Falcon and the Winter Soldier at least attempted to explore themes and issues with a direct link to the consequences of the main films. The latter in particular did sometimes explore the lingering aftershocks you'd naturally expect after having had half the population of the planet disappear and then reappear after a time, even if it then did become far too interested too quickly in the current psychodrama around race. But Hawkeye has none of this. Besides the opening flashback, designed to set up an origin story for a character nobody has ever seen or heard of before, as opposed to the one who lends his name to the series, the only real sense we get of the consequences of the Avengers' great drama is tied to the Ronin suit, seen for all of a few minutes in Endgame. And even then, it's been reduced to the cheapest of MacGuffins, or if you're familiar with EFAP law, McMuffins. The only actual consequence of this especially dark episode in the life of Clint Barton is that a group of hackneyed comic relief villains called and I shit you not, the tracksuit mafia appear to cause some trouble. The tracksuit mafia. <laughs> oh. <laughs> These people aren't villains. They're not even set up to be villains. They're vaguely thuggish, but they're also comic relief and they're incompetent. They're there because fight scenes need to happen, but they're not a threat. They present no peril. They don't serve to set up any kind of stakes, and their sole reason for being there anyway is that they're mildly pissed off by something Ronin did. But this only serves to cheapen Ronin's brief arc and Clint's broader arc in the Avengers, because it's shorn of all the gravity, all the darkness and the desperation that animated it. Clint Barton, Hawkeye himself, for now at least, very slightly conveys the marks of his old story, and by episode 3, he is showing the physical cost of a normal man who has repeatedly survived extraordinary odds. And that's kind of poignant. But we don't really get any of this until we're two-thirds into the third episode, beyond a half-assed attempt to set up a will-he-be-home-for-Christmas motive with his kids, the show having sacrificed a genuine storyline for what it unwisely chose to make its real purpose, not an homage to a retiring hero, but the introduction of a new one, a new one that because of the MCU, isn't so much new as it is a knockoff replacement. Perhaps Disney's famed closeness with China has had broader effects than we realise. Clint himself is old, is tired, is suffering, and one gets the strong feeling that Jeremy Renner didn't have to act particularly hard to give this impression, because he seems to be old, tired, and suffering throughout. But the main character in Hawkeye isn't Hawkeye. It's rail replacement thus Hawkeye, which isn't a spoiler or a surprise, because, well... By the end, you almost envy Clint's loss of hearing because he at least doesn't have to listen to rail replacement Hawkeye, who's just... Ugh, oh, God. Let's explore. Replacing male heroes with their female equivalents is a thoroughly odd, thoroughly modern, and so a thoroughly shit trope. It's the result of an astonishingly superficial substitute for thought in writing rooms today that thinks creating characters is easy and quick and painless. Rather than go to the trouble of inventing brand new female heroes with complicated characters and moral nuance and complexity, rather than put in the painstaking work of building the lore, rather than establishing character by showing their deeds, establishing their place and their personality by their interactions and their subtler quirks, modern writers seem to think that all you need, 
and it really is the most you need, is to give a 30 second flashback, explained by exposition and hackneyed dialogue that they're super strong and talented and independent, have them kick ass and be liked by everyone around them, and in the case of Hawkeye and Ironheart, give them a same or a similar title as an established hero. The results are, well, the results. But a box has been ticked, new life has ostensibly been breathed into an old trademark, and even if this means it's come to look like some kind of zombified husk that it's cruel to keep alive, at least that zombified husk has tits. God, I miss the days when they thought it was creative to turn planks of wood into main characters. Is that like a personal attack or something? Or oh, no, sorry, let me just, uh... I mean, I miss the days when they thought it was creative to turn planks of wood into main characters. In a sense, there's little point delving into the character of Kate Bishop because there is no character to delve into. It's like mining for gold in a cloud or the vacuum of space. Kate is a fan fiction character, and as anyone who has ever suffered fan fiction will know, this involves inserting an idealized version of the author into an established canon, in which they become essential and indispensable and profoundly important. And they're perfect, too. It's very important that they're perfect, and highly skilled and strong and flawless, and that they form instant relationships with the actual characters in the world they've invaded like a particularly malignant cancer. You'd think at this point that the traits of a Mary Sue would be so well known that even an incompetent writer would be able to avoid at least some of them. But this is not so with Kate Bishop in Hawkeye, who is essential and indispensable and profoundly important and perfect and highly skilled and strong and flawless, and who forms instant relationships with the actual characters in the world she's invaded like a particularly malignant cancer. To make matters substantially worse, this particular Mary Sue is a Marvel brand Mary Sue, which means you get no wit or originality, but rather that kind of cheap, trite, chirpy, quirky, mass-produced humour that every Marvel film since Guardians of the Galaxy has insisted on foisting on its characters. In fact, you could put every single one of her lines in Tom Holland's mouth. The overabundance of unserious, throwaway lines is by far the most irritating thing about that iteration of Spider-Man, and absolutely no rewriting would be needed. But the original cast of Avengers, this kind of worked, because at least their snarky one-liners were coloured by their established personalities, but in Kate Bishop, there is no established personality. There is no personality at all. And so there is no colour. It's just paint-by-numbers quips that make her utterly indistinguishable from any number of paint-by-numbers ancillary characters to have been thrown on screen across the last half decade. Either one of these alone makes for a terrible character, but both together? Well, that makes me think we should just consider reopening and expanding the terms of the Nuremberg Tribunal. What little there is that might have been likeable about Kate is completely overshadowed by how overwhelmingly shallow and irritating she is as a character. She's the daughter of a rich bird. Her father died in the opening flashback, and rich bird now is with a swarthy looking Dick Dastardly type with a moustache, again Dick Dastardly's moustache, who it is heavily implied is the villain of the series, but mostly because of the gaping hole where the actual villain should be. We learn bits and pieces about Kate from her conversations with her mother, chiefly about how perfect she is. We learn that she was a brilliant archer as a kid, some kind of state champion in fencing, and a black belt at the age of 14, all of which we have to be told because it would otherwise have been spectacularly unbelievable that a pampered rich girl should be able to hold her own against gangs of goons, however obliging those goons might be. Thanks to this hackneyed exposition, it is only remarkably unbelievable that a pampered rich girl should be able to hold her own against gangs of goons, however obliging they might be. This is beyond lazy. Remember actual Hawkeye? Remember how he was introduced as a talented, trained, lethal operative? Remember how we didn't really need to be told anything about his backstory or how he got his skills? Remember how we came to know all this because we were shown it in action relevant to the films he was in? Fittingly for a secret agent, and necessarily because he was really a C-list member of the main cast, we were never given an origin story or indeed very much information about him as a person, which was used to good effect in later films when, for instance, we discover that he has a life outside, a wife and kids. He's also shown being bested frequently by the A-list cast and being aware of his relatively lowly status, as well as his fundamental humanity. He suffers injuries the others do not, he gets tired when they do not. He's aware of his own vulnerability and, later in the main arc of Avengers, of his age, looking forward to retiring into obscurity to live a normal life. This is relatively subtle, careful writing. It gives us all the depth necessary for a character who was not all that often more than a secondary fixture in the main plot, and then a little bit extra to surprise us. The point about Clint Barton isn't that he's perfect, it's that he isn't. It's not that he's a superhero, because he's not really a superhero. He's very good at what he does, but what he does is limited, and it takes a toll on him physically. This is not so with Kate, who doesn't even have the advantage of an interesting background. 
Her background is that of the rich kid who has pretty much whatever she wants, unlike, say, Peter Parker, some of whose character at least rests not on his powers and skills but on the strife of a poor childhood. Hawkeye, the series, is much more interested in Kate than it is in Clint, at least for its first half, yet it squanders what we know of the real or current anyway Hawkeye's true character by saying too much. Though his whole shtick is the reluctant hero, the one who doesn't want fame or renown, and the series does go as far as to point this out when Kate tries to convince him to improve his brand, he nonetheless walks about in broad daylight without any attempt at disguise, despite saying in episode 3 that his job for the last however many years has been to be unrecognisable, ensuring that he is recognised whenever the script thinks it's necessary, signing autographs and such, but inexplicably not recognised when he either doesn't need to be or needs not to be. Unlike Clint, Kate's improbable skills are explained rather than shown in the first instance, with the exception of the archery. Uh, the opening flashback shows us a young Kate being inspired by current Hawkeye as he jumps off a building in front of an ill-disguised green screen, and closes with her saying, I need a bow. We join her again in the present day as she shoots an arrow with a tennis ball attached from a rooftop into a church tower to ring the bell, and then the church tower collapses. Uh, yeah? Cool. This is also when her insufferable chirpiness and flippant Marvel standard quips begin, and it is the first moment she appears on screen in her current and future form, so if you're already tired of this kind of humour, it's going to be a very long show. And unlike Clint, when she uses her talents, there is no real cost. Her mother tells her at one point that young people think they're invincible and rich people think they're invincible, you've always been both, but let me tell you, you're not, and yet, when, after she shows up at an auction house selling Ronin's sword and suit, after that auction house is raided by the... Oh, God. By the tracksuit mafia. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And then she dons the suit and fights them off. She emerges with nothing more than a minor scrape. At one point on the run, she is literally hit by a car, yet two seconds later she's up and rescuing a dog without even a grimace or a limp, she's not even panting. Hawkeye rescues her, though given she's previously beaten up several other goons without breaking a sweat, it's not immediately obvious that he needed to, and then he takes her into hiding. Because she is a Mary Sue, they instantly strike up, not so much a bond as a transactional relationship, where he says things seriously and she makes one of those witless quirky quips and then he sighs. The tone of this series is all over the place, by the way. Ronan once represented something especially dark, gritty, tragic, but the suit is now a mere MacGuffin. Whenever there isn't a fight scene, we get quip after quip, lightly comic. I was about to say comic relief, but it's not a relief, really, it's more of a burden. Then we're immediately thrown back into an action sequence, but the proceeding divorces the action of any real weight, any sense of threat. And then she's back to quipping again, or the goons are goofing around, or Clint is doing his tired old dad look. Oh, and Christmas references. There's lots of Christmas stuff, from the decoration to the music. It's like doing a Christmas special of Jason Bourne. It's just thoroughly odd. Just because you can genre-bend doesn't mean that you should. Several critics have praised the chemistry between Kate and Clint, but I really don't see it. For the first two episodes, it consists solely of cheap gags, the most worn-out contrast of chippy young thing and weary old cynic. I'll grant that it improves some way into episode three, but only because the series actually begins to take the time to treat semi-seriously with Clint's declining physical condition, and Kate expressing sympathy for him at least ensures she has something to say that isn't inane chirpy humour. They end up in her flat, but the tracksuit... Oh my god. But the tracksuit mafia... <sighs> Jesus. Uh, but the tracksuit mafia find them because her name's on the buzzer, which you'd think Clint, being a master sleuth, might have spotted himself? But him being in character in this moment would have been very inconvenient for the writers, and so he misses this obvious giveaway. The flat is petrol-bombed, they escape again, but they leave the suit behind. They hide out in another flat while Clint goes back to retrieve the suit because it has its own memory now, and so its continued existence would put both of them in danger. Only he can't, because when he returns to the flat it's been taken... by a LARPer. What? Why? Yes. No, it's an actual LARPer, as in live-action role-play. It, it's been taken by a LARPer for no other reason, apparently, than that the writers thought it might be funny to have Hawkeye go to a LARP event and play along to get it back. Yeah, 
I, I'm, I'm, yeah. Oh, cool, cool, whatever. Meanwhile, Kate fails to convince her mother that the cartoon villain she's shacked up with is in fact a cartoon villain, even after she attempts to stab him in the face in a fencing match, because reasons. Apparently she thought this would be terribly convincing if he in fact saved his own life, but if her mother couldn't spot that Dick Dastardly was evil because of his moustache and general demeanour, she was never going to get that hint. Clint allows himself to be captured by the... No. Nope, it's still shit, by the tracksuit mafia, but thankfully stops short of saying, take me to your leader, though this is the setup. Kate calls him, then tracks his phone, because her mum works for a security company and she interns for her mum, and therefore her phone can track other people's phones, which seems perfectly safe and legal. She drops in, literally, as in she falls in through the roof, and interrupts the non-interrogation of Flint by, uh, by the, uh, by the tracksuit mafia. Which, which isn't an interrogation, because the series is playing these guys as comedic props for much, much more than they're worth. Then, then, which is to say, in the third episode, as in halfway through the series, it decides to introduce us to a kind of villain. The head of... Mm, the head... The, the head of the tracksuit mafia. <laughs> whose name is Maya Lopez. It's not an exaggeration to say that the scariest thing about her is her taste in music. She wants to find Ronin because Ronin killed her dad at some point in the past, apparently. She breaks Clint's hearing aid, which is not really what you want to do when you're trying to get information from someone, but then Clint and Kate escape and we learn precious more about her. Now, you don't generally introduce bad guys with backstories this late in proceedings. The audience has absolutely no frame of reference, nothing to cling on to, nothing to grapple with. And because the whole thing is so frivolous, nothing really to feel about Lopez. The writers do, the writers care about her very much because she is a woman, she is doubly disabled, and she's a Native American, which is lesbianism short of a full house in diversity bingo. Hers would have been at least as useful as a flashback as Kate's was, but we weren't given anything, we're not given anything until, again, episode 3, when we learn, perfunctorily, that she's been deaf since she was a kid and she loved her daddy, but this is incredibly perfunctory. It's there because the writers need to introduce her and need to make up for the fact that they've not bothered to do this until the last available moment. A competently written series might have teased her introduction, if not introduced her fully much earlier, giving bits and pieces of relevant information so that by the time she becomes a feature in the plot, we are at least able to understand something of her motive. Such an approach might have invited us to empathise with her, or at least to ponder whether we should empathise with her, the two best types of villain are the unstoppable demonic force of nature or the tragic anti-hero type, one who is beguiling precisely because a part of us can see their point or at least sympathise with it or empathise with the circumstances in which they find themselves. The writers aim for the second, kind of, but they badly rush it. The alternative would have been to introduce her as a serious force, a silent menace, one whose lack of backstory but sheer presence establishes her as a kind of extra human force, think Darth Vader in A New Hope, which could then be teased out later on, giving her a bit more depth, a bit more vulnerability. I might have been tempted to reverse things entirely, begin the series with her flashback, which closes with Ronan murdering her father, begin then with Kate in the present day and build her character more slowly, show her skills, don't tell people about them, drop in her backstory subtly, over time, ideally make her much more flawed than she currently is, with much more to learn, an overall darker tone would have made for a much better series, though it wouldn't necessarily suit its inexplicable desire to be a cheerful Christmas story. But I'd counter that its want to be a cheerful Christmas story doesn't actually suit the story it's trying to tell, and the story should be its priority, no? There are dark and morally serious Christmas tales anyway, there have been since at least the time of Dickens, so it wouldn't be breaking utterly new ground. We know how uncomfortable the Marvel is with innovation these days. Such a build-up would have established all three of our principal characters, the old hero, the new hero, and the anti-hero, as rounded entities, showing the audience at least as much as it tells the audience, and giving real weight then to their first meeting, shedding the impression that this whole thing has sort of been created on the fly. But this doesn't happen, and Lopez is none of these things, and the organisation she heads has been castrated by the series' attempts at comedy, so she doesn't carry any significance or consequence into her first scene, and she's barely on screen long enough to explain her motive, certainly not long enough for her character to form, before Kate and Clint escape. At one point, Clint does one of his slow-motion flying through the air arrow tricks and falls into a ball pool. That's, that's the tone of this series, a, a kid's ball pool, in the middle of a fight scene, having just introduced what is ostensibly your main villain. 
We then have a car chase with lots of crazy over-the-top set pieces, which critics for some reason applauded. An even more infuriatingly flippant back and forth, even as Kate is literally hanging out of a window shooting magic arrows at their pursuers. Each of the arrows has random improbable effects, which she doesn't know about in advance. And yet each of them seems to do exactly what circumstance requires them to. How incredibly lucky. A few more improbable arrow shots later and they escape, leaving Lopez behind. Now, I've not read the comics, I know nothing about Lopez's backstory, but I am morally certain, because they are telegraphing it, that she'll turn out to be a good person. There is no such thing as a doubly disabled Native American bad person, it breaks the fundamental law of the modern universe. They end up back at the mansion attempting to hack into the Bishop's security database, at which point a sword appears under Clint's chin, held by... Are you sitting down? You won't have seen this coming. It's held by swarthy Dick Dastardly himself. And that's it. That's episodes one to three. Now, we're only halfway in. There is that to be said for it. It hasn't had time to completely and utterly doom itself. The first half has been anything but impressive, but there is still time for something to be salvaged from the premonition of a car crash that this series currently represents. A car crash, moreover, involving people nobody knows or cares about. Kate has to become a more serious character, a much more serious character, with many more flaws, preferably. This will involve injecting her with three shots and then a booster of genuine personality, not just witty one-liners and frivolous throwaways. Swarthy Dick Dastardly will need to have been made into a serious villain, not just this shallow cartoon character. The series needs real stakes, real motives, real stories to tell, not just moronic goon squads chasing a McMuffin. Happily for the writers, at least if they choose to take the opportunity, this marries with another of what must be the series' priorities. Clint is not only the most recognisable and developed character, he's also the one with moral nuance and complexity. He's the one who's on his way out, the one really grappling with trouble and strife, and the one with obvious stakes. Endgame and Infinity War handled this pretty well by foregoing the backstory but revealing his human side and his human attachments. It didn't need to take much time in which to do this, but in a few short scenes establishes his values, his motives, and tells you something about his character that pages of exposition couldn't do. Revive this kind of approach, and the series might achieve something like a fitting send-off, adding some emotional weight to a show that has shown precious little of it thus far. There's something innately tragic about Clint's character. I am torn at the moment, though, between the virtues of actually killing him off after he's fulfilled this mission, which would be in keeping, I think, with his general arc, and letting him live and retire and while away his days with the family he's always cherished, which would be a deserved end, if a little bit conventional. Though because it is conventional, I suspect this is the route they'll go down, and he will make it home for Christmas one way or another. The director of the final episode is Reese Thomas, who has done nothing in his career to suggest he has an appetite for anything approaching tonal or moral complexity. Indeed, his stint at Saturday Night Live is probably why the series' attempts at humour leave you cringing as hard as, well, as hard as you would if you were watching Saturday Night Live. That's what should happen anyway, but as for what will happen, well, let's go back to the start. I think it's likely they'll muddle through, perhaps with some slight improvement as the focus naturally moves back to current Hawkeye's struggles with senescence. It's hard to handle that abysmally, which is not to say the series will necessarily handle it well, but even a barely competent focus on that aspect of his character would improve the overall tone and seriousness of a series that's really lacking any reason to be. But, even assuming they get to the end without making a bad thing worse, still the question remains, what's the point? Where are we going from here? The MCU managed to tell a story over a decade. It was a spectacular achievement. And Phase 4 necessarily requires that we step back and rebuild. I know that, that's been said before, ad nauseum. It's true. Fair enough. But it's also insufficient as an excuse. And it overlooks what made Phase 1 work. Phase 1 had all the big toys to play with. Characters even normies had heard of before. In Robert Downey Jr., it found the perfect hinge for the rest of the series. He had the charm, the depth, the versatility. His playboy past matched that of his character. Despite his public struggles, he was ripe for a comeback. There's a reason they paid him so much money. The writing, for which John Favreau deserves no small amount of credit, perfectly matched the casting. There could be no other Iron Man than Robert Downey Jr., arguably more iconic in this role even than Christopher Reeve as Superman or Heath Ledger as the Joker. He can't be replaced, certainly not by Ironheart, the success of which will require a degree of subtlety and intelligence and imagination the MCU shows no signs of possessing anymore. The MCU lacks any equivalent of Downey Jr. It shows no signs of finding one. Its existing cast of characters doesn't exactly scream charisma. 
Its biggest remaining names were part of the B-list throughout the Infinity Saga, and little has been done to elevate them since. The new characters lack promise, and their casting brings no star power. And there is currently no established, overarching story. The true achievement of the Infinity Arc wasn't in its individual films. Scorsese was right in one regard. Taken individually, Marvel films are mass-produced, their lines are learned by rote. But in stringing a meta storyline out over a decade, it meant events in each installment mattered, even if the films themselves weren't exactly groundbreaking. The meta story provides the gravity that holds every installment in its proper orbit. It gives you something to invest in, a reason to geosynchronize around that particular star, that particular galaxy, in the first place. Yet it was built in the first instance on ostensibly standalone stories that had their own mass. The first Iron Man film acts as a kind of Jupiter, the only planet in the solar system that cannot be said to orbit the sun. It's so large that its barycenter, the point around which it revolves, sits between the body and the light, the planet and the star, the particular and the universal, or at least the uh, solar systemic. But the MCU today lacks both these crucial ingredients. There is no gravity in it. Yes, it seems to have accepted the need to scale down, to build again from the ground up. But worryingly, it seems to have exhausted the originality that animated its initial construction. Hawkeye seems disinterested, even by its own progenitor. It lacks the will to place this new story within the context of the old, the thing on which it is ostensibly building. And its attempt to reconstruct an understated yet load-bearing piece of architecture, to pass the torch, if you'll forgive the cliché, from the old to the new, shows all the signs of creative bankruptcy. The writers aren't interested in learning how original Hawkeye was crafted, never mind replicating that. Whilst Clint Barton was made by inference, by implication, by snatched glimpses of the human and the humanity that lies beneath the mysterious mystique of him, all the blueprints for the new Hawkeye are laid before us in this series, and they're geometric, they're uncomplicated, they're unsubtle. Most criminally of all, they're mass-produced, bearing all the hallmarks of the trademark, with lines, quirks, and personality that could be swapped between any of Marvel's recent creations without causing any contradiction or misstep in the characters they're grafted onto. Kate Bishop is basically Peter Parker. They share far too many of the same personality traits. The only difference is, is that she uses a bow whereas he uses web slingers, he grew up poor whereas she grew up rich, and Tom Holland has a better ass. So we return, in the end, to the question of the end. If it has nothing left to say, if its story has already been told, and if its creative spark has descended from white hot to red ember to ashes and then to dust, why is the MCU still going? Why is it speaking words when it has no meaning to impart? But otherwise, why is it flogging a horse that's so dead its only conceivable use today is to be turned into glue at a knacker's yard? Maybe all of this is premature. Maybe I'm prejudging. The best of teachers can seldom predict the lives of the children they teach, and Kate Bishop, despite being in her twenties in Hawkeye, is a child both figuratively and in her characterization literally. Patience is an overrated virtue, but that does not automatically excuse or justify impatience, so perhaps we'll be sitting here in ten years' time marvelling at the next cosmic meta-drama Marvel has delighted us with. But I just can't shake the feeling that all that's worthy has been said and done now, that the youth and vigour and fearless imagination that gave rise to the MCU has grown up and lost its soul and reached middle age, where excitement gives way to obligation, and the risk of innovation cannot be brooked, for there are bills to pay and chores to do and dead-end jobs to keep. As Auden wrote, time and fevers burn away individual beauty from thoughtful children, and the grave proves the child ephemeral. Maybe, just maybe, it's all over. Maybe it should have ended with Endgame. Maybe it's time to let good things die and stop pretending greatness can defy entropy. Perhaps we should stop pretending that stories can last forever, and instead begin looking back at what was achieved rather than masquerading this sense that we can sustain that greatness indefinitely. The choice is stark, though it's not an easy one. Do we persist with this adventure, or, like Odysseus, do we accept that the journey has ended? And what made that story relevant was not actually the homecoming, but the longing for home. Each new entry from the MCU only makes me more convinced that the time has come to give up on excitement at the new, which must fade sooner or later, and look upon the Infinity Saga as the beginning, the middle, and the end of this story. In other words, perhaps it's time for us to be thankful, thankful, but nostalgic.